It is Wednesday, December 9th, 2020. It is 8 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, and so you know what time it is. It's time for a little bit of coin metal. And it was yet another non virtual get your ass kicked at Jiu Jitsu Wednesday. Uh, my partner and I doing some good stuff. Yeah. No, no actual ass kicking, though. I, I didn't, uh, I didn't actually get to do any um, any like on the ground kind of stuff today. Um, I, I mean, I I did, but I I didn't get to do any um, sparring today. It was a little bit confusing, but honestly, I had a very 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 capable partner. Uh, he's certainly ahead of me as far as the uh, as the tenth planet system goes. And so, uh, yeah, he was very, very helpful. He's very, very understanding and very, very patient. And I really, really appreciated that. And I know I'm like, you know, very, very, really, really here. But, like, seriously, I, I really appreciate that. You know, somebody's... And the, the thing is, is he's, um, he's a young guy. But, I mean, I'll tell you, for his age, you know, it always amazes me when there's, when there's kids, effectively... You know, this is no no hit on him, but I, I don't think he's like 21 years old yet, and he is so physically capable, and he strikes me as as somebody who potentially might have had some social issues in school at least at one point or another. Um, but at the same time, very very helpful. He he reminds me a lot of a uh, of the one kid that would be the uh, teacher's assistant, like no matter what. He, he seems like that kind of person. You know, and, and although I sometimes get the impression that it was something that he he had to he had to actually make an effort to learn, you know. And I know this is kind of like off on the beaten path or whatever, but I, it, he's a really cool guy. And and should he continue with jujitsu as he has, uh, I could easily see him becoming a black belt. You know, and being one of those people that does actually persevere through to the end, uh, with or as far far down the road as you can get in any one human life. I mean, because there there is just like so much to jujitsu. I mean, like we'll we'll be doing stuff in like one of the reasons why they don't uh, like stop in and address every little thing like during the time that you're doing it is because you haven't like fully gotten it down yet like even the way that they've shown you but your brain is already trying to think of new ways or at least my brain is trying to think of new ways new efficient ways to do it and if you let somebody like me start asking questions in the middle of it you'll never get anywhere you know you'll be stuck at like the first three minutes of the of the explanation or something like that <laughs> instead of being able to get through an hour-long class of uh, of material but yeah, as far as what we were doing today, again, I, I always have the hardest time trying to describe exactly what we were doing. But it started off from a position where you have your your opponent is flat on his back and has you in a lockdown on one side. And so the, the primary part of it is freeing that leg up. Or getting it to where you don't have any legs. Because at one point, when you're trying to get your, your leg loose, they trap the other. And so there's a point where you have to switch your knee up. And this is the part that I had the most trouble with. is Because you kind of like creep it up like you're, you're trying to, to close it up to get into S-mount. And, and eventually you do take it to S-mount. But like, you, you know, you're doing double underhooks and bringing your arms up slowly up under theirs to drive their their elbows up over their head and you get it like about three quarters of the way there and then you address the leg that gets caught by by like popping yourself up just enough to where you have a little body area between you and your opponent and you swap your right knee and this is assuming that your opponent has your left foot in in a quarter guard and you, you swap your your um right knee from their their uh, right side under you over them you know in between your bodies and take it to the other side and see one thing i was doing to kind of shorten this process 
and I don't know if it was originally instructed this way or not, but I like to take my foot and curl it right on top of the hip there. Instead of instead of taking my foot all the way out of the action zone, I like to have it like right up on the inner thigh there and and to where my ankle is hooking up over the top of their thigh. And the reason being is that gives me some downward pressure to keep them pinned while I'm doing whatever I'm doing, you know, elsewhere. And so um I felt that was a uh, that was a good way to set it up to where I was already ready to push my opponent's uh, right or left leg out a little bit to where I could free my left leg because they have it in a quarter guard. And that, that makes it to where you can move up the body, take it to an S mount, and then from there, of course, it would go to the arm bar if you did it right. And I've always had trouble with S mount, and that was one of the only mounts that I consistently had trouble with. I think I've, I may have pulled off the uh, the migration to S mount and an arm bar like once, maybe twice. I mean, I've set it up several times, but I've always got my hip in the wrong position. And and realistically, you want to have it to where like. Your taint is on their shoulder practically, you know, instead of instead of you having your buttock on, on the ground or even your hips on the ground. You know, you want to be on top of that shoulder so where you, you could literally just like lift up on that arm and, and you know, get get the old taparoonie. But I, I don't know, I've, I've been getting to a different stage in my jiu-jitsu mentally where I, I feel like... Uh, there's like all these new possibilities opening up as far as like the the approaches that I can do to things. And uh, one of the things I and <laughs> I wrote this to one of my my instructional partners uh, where I I just I was having some some uh, oh what what's that word insomnia and, and it's re- really really rare for me. I mean I gotta I gotta drink some high dose caffeine within a couple hours of my trying to go to sleep for that to happen and I'm pretty sure that is exactly what did happen but anyway I had seen one of my one of my other training partners um, get caught in a triangle and I don't like triangles uh, I have the hardest time setting them up uh, because my my hip mobility coordination issues or at least the ones that I have had that I'm working out and I've, I've never liked triangles. I always get confused on, on which foot to have up and over and which one to have tying in and all that. And so when I saw um, my partner get into this, this triangle or get caught by it, I'm just like, stack, just fucking stack. And she, she didn't stack. And I got to think that it was because her opponent had her other arm tied up really, really good. And, and so, of course... You know, like I said, I keep trying to think of ways that that I utilize that that may have you know helped get it out of that situation. And a few of the things that I thought about, I was, I don't know why it occurred to me, but I think there's a possibility in there if you were, if if, and there's real real big if, if your opponent does not have control, like just. Just for example, say they've got their their leg up over your right right shoulder, and you know they've got you in the triangle, and they're trying to control that left arm to pull it over and, and squeeze all the air out of you, or or at least squeeze all the blood out of you, or out of your head. I don't know. Anyway, the the big key to escaping that, I think, well, or at least a big key is keeping control of that left hand. You know, if they manage to to twist it backwards, kind of dunsky, you know, and there there is a way to to get that, and it's it's not very comfortable. But anyway, and and even on that point, there is there is a way to address that one too. You know, if they if they do manage to get your arm on that side, if you take your other arm, the arm that isn't isn't tied up, and you reach around the back of their thigh. And then to the outside of your hand and pull, pull down. That can open the legs up enough to, to where you can slip your head out. 
it's it's not the most glorious way, and there is the chance also that they can almost plot at you from there. So you know you want to keep your base really solid when you're trying that. Either that, or make sure that you're all the way on that side, because if you don't. Again, they could they could flip it around and maybe get you in a normal plot, especially if they maintain control of that that wrist, you know, because they have a hold of the wrist. And the first mission you got is to get re get control of that arm. And and after you've done so, you want to really tuck it really really tight to their thighs. Okay, so like right 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 above their thigh, you know. So you're like pulling down on their the top of their hips basically and then you can swap it over and one of the things that I was thinking is this that if if I were in her position that I would have wanted to if I could get control of that left hand push out on the the right leg enough to where I could get the elbow back down under the crotch and again I know this person I know this person did absolutely everything they could have got her out of it. So this is no knock on her. <laughs> this is no knock on her at all because I'll be honest with you. I rolled with her and number one, I'm like three times her age. I'm also like 80 pounds heavier than her. So I'm sure that if I weighed the same amount as, as her opponent, she would have tore me a new fucking asshole. I mean, absolutely, no doubt. And, and even even with the size differential, man, she had me at least like four times. She was going for a fucking submission. She had an, an excellent start to a submission, you know. But, of course, I'm a bit stronger, and so I managed to, like, strength my way out of it. And, you know, it's not a very glorious thing to do, you know. I probably should have just let her have have it because I mean like she had a mean ass triangle start on me and if I didn't do what I'm talking about I would have gotten fucking triangle choked by her and and like I said I'm damn near three times her age and about 80 pounds heavier than her so that gives you an idea of how skilled this person is okay I'm not convinced that she wasn't taking it easy on me I'll be perfectly honest and I mean that, you know, if, if I was all egotistical about my jujitsu, I would not be able to admit that. But let me tell you, she's a badass. <laughs> no joke. So anyway, but I was thinking about this. And the times that I have gotten out of a triangle, this has been a key. Is if you can get that elbow down, you can get that elbow to where you're, you're like a Tyrannosaurus Rex, right? You know, you just have your forearm and their wrist potentially within their control zone, right? Then you take your other hand, your right hand in this case, and rotate it to where your palm is up. And there's there's a spot there where your, your bone on your forearm is is kind of kind of closest to your skin, so you like really have to rotate it under. I mean, to where to where you're damn near looking at the bottom of your pinky on your palm or the bottom of your hand you know like if you were to hold it with your thumb up that's the thumb up is the top side the pinky side is the downside if you were to bring your pinky to where it's like the highest point possible and then you reach over with your Tyrannosaurus Rex arm and you grab a hold of the thumb you reach all the way over the thumb and you really want to rotate that down and if you can at all do it at all possible there's a section right there on the quadricep where it dips down right before your kneecap and you want to put that spot like on your forearm like right in there and then you bring it in as tight as you can you know so you're pushing into your body with your right hand you're pulling it across with your left hand just tight 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 motherfucker tight and then you push downward on it and bring your shoulders and chest up and that's to pop that leg loose now again I know this person. She's very, very skilled. And I'm sure that if it had occurred to her, she'd have fucking done it. And and the only reason it didn't occur to her is because she was way tied up with that other arm being occupied. And and yeah, it was occupied. Nonetheless, like I said, if you're at all possible able to get the again, situational, if you're able to get a hold of that left arm and get it back down below the uh, get your elbow below the crotch of your opponent this is possible 
It wasn't possible in her particular case because of the way that she had her feet, for one thing. Uh, she, I believe she had her, she was on her knees. And that's good to prevent a sweep because if you bring your, your foot up, your opponent can grab the back of your ankle and sweep you. Just the same, it, it gives you the possibility to extend your your upper body in such a way that you can reopen the triangle. And I'm, I've been trying to think of it in terms of somebody who potentially isn't as strong as I am. And again, you want to... I, I explained it to somebody today that, you know, if you're, if you're lighter than your opponent, if you're smaller than your opponent, then the real key for you is focusing, focusing an, as much force as you possibly can generate, as much weight as you can possibly generate on the smallest possible segment of your opponent's body. And, I mean, you'd be amazed at how much force even a small person can exert on a one by one inch spot on your body. And if they're doing it right, you feel like you've got a 300 pound person on you. And then it is possible, you know, it's, it's really, a, I think the biggest thing, and it was explained by the instructor the other day, that the farther you get your, your limbs out from your body, the more vulnerable they become. Well, there's also another one in there. The closer you have your limbs to your body, the stronger they are. Okay, so when you're managing that three inches from, your, from being your, your elbows tight to your sides to extended two or three inches, that is your strongest section. So if you can fit your movement or your escape or your whatever into a start or an entry, that only requires just that little bit of movement. Those are the kinds of things that you need to do, you know. Especially if you're, if like I said, if you're lighter or you're you're not as strong as your opponent. The key is, you know, if you're not if you're smaller, become even smaller. A lot of times, if your opponent is bigger than you, their their limbs are longer than you. So getting in tight you know, is, is the key. If you, if you can stay really, really tight to your opponent, they have a real hard time trying to get off of you or get you off of them. You know, they have to work a hand in there and frame it. And oh my God, now they've given you an arm. Now you can go for that arm bar. You know, but the, again, focusing on the, the really strong segments or strong movements, you know, like things that involve your legs you know, if you can bring, if you're having trouble keeping control of an arm, maybe put a leg in there somewhere. If you've got a leg free, you know, flip it around, zip it in there and see if you can break that free. I, I do it all the time and I'm, I'm stronger than a lot of people my size. So <laughs> just to give you an idea, there, there's, I, I know I don't know jack shit when it comes to jujitsu, you know, and, and even being in it for I, I should say about four years now. Um, even so, I still feel like it's the first day every time I come in there. And I, I think that's one of the reasons why I keep coming back is because there's there's always something to learn. Even on shit that you know. Even on shit that you've drilled and you've drilled and you've drilled and you've drilled. Some stranger can walk in, have a blue belt under their, under their belt already, and, and the experience that it took to get that blue belt... And they can show you something on that move that you've never seen before. Not in the four years you've been fucking training. So, <laughs> you know, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's that kind of thing that keeps you humble about it. You know, I mean, it's, there, there isn't a book big enough to have all of jujitsu in it. And I mean, once you, once you start contemplating it in that context, you know, I don't know shit. <laughs> You know, I'm just, I'm just a little, little drop in the big ass ocean and not, e not even a very big drop at that, you know, anyway, let's go ahead and throw down with some music. And as far as where we want to go for music, you know, we're going to go to body count and I, I've, man, I've been feeling this one a lot lately. So here it is. Talk shit. Get shot. First stance here on coin metal.
And that was Vola with the same war. Oh man, I should have let that one go. It's fucking Meshuggah, born in dissonance, huh? Now, now we had to get back to work eventually, right? <laughs> Anywho, as far as what we're going to get into, the first thing I got here, and I, I, I thought this was hilarious, really. This is not this man's first go around with regard to crypto. And uh, it's really funny, you know, if, you, if you've if you spent enough time in this space, um, you really get to understand a lot about people um, just in the way that they react to cryptocurrencies or the idea of them. Like, uh, I'll give you an example, like Bill Gates. You know, his, his approach to it has always been something that, you know, it, it's not something he can dominate, so inherently he doesn't like it. But the ways that he does want to participate in it are, of course, inherently evil and disproportionately beneficial for him and not so much for his customers. Only minimally so for his customers. You know, because you're just a fucking slave, according to Bill. But anyway... <laughs> This guy, the way he's reacted with crypto it has, has been kind of surprising. You know who we haven't heard from in a while and who, again, really surprised me with his reaction to crypto is um, Mr. Bill Shatner. We haven't heard too much from him. Um, but anyway, uh, this one, I think you guys all recognize this. Uh, this is on Cointelegraph.com and this is by Cyrus McNally. So, yes, penis. Steve Wozniak based token Woz X skyrockets ahead of second listing. <laughs> Apple co founder Steve Wozniak's new token, E-Force, Woz X, almost doubled in price today after an astonishing run that saw the price increase around 26 times in the past week. Woz X will open for trading on South Korea based exchange Bitthumb on December 9th and is already up 2,490% since first being listed on HBTC Exchange on December 3rd. It opened at $0.10 cents per token and is currently at $2.59. Ethereum blockchain token WASX is a way to securitize energy savings. The token has a total supply of $1 billion and was sold via private funding rounds conducted earlier this year, receiving an initial valuation of $80 million. It received a market cap of $950 million in its first 13 minutes of trading, according to the eponymous um, company behind the token, eForce. It is Wozniak's second blockchain-related venture since co-founding Apple in his parents' garage in 1976, touting itself as, quote, the first blockchain-based energy savings platform, eForce aims to encourage the reduction of energy consumption in a way that is meaningful but does not disrupt current human behavior or routine. Hmm. You know, the... I, I think the big problem with the whole, you know, let's let's cut down everybody's energy consumption is the focus. See, it shouldn't be on on limiting or reducing our energy consumption. As a matter of fact, there should be there there's no excuse why there shouldn't be energy for everybody to consume as much as they fucking want to. The problem exists in our mentality with regard to energy and the creation thereof. We've always focused on it as some sort of control mechanism that we have to constrain everybody's activities by. And by doing that, we limit the utilization of the available energy sources around us and often overlook ones that are much more environmentally friendly. Continuing. It is Wozniak's second project. Uh, blah, blah, blah. I'm trying to find that. Okay, yeah. 
E4 aims to encourage energy reduction consumption in a way that is meaningful but does not disrupt current human behavior or routine. Okay, we'll make faster chips. WASX tokens will be used on the platform by contributors who want to take part in energy saving projects and as rewards based on the amount of energy the user has saved. Wozniak is joined at eForce by co-founders Jacopo Vicetti and Jacopo Venetti who serve as project lead and chief technical officer respectively. That's weird that they both have the same first name but different last names. What do you want to bet they're the same person? The company was founded in 2019 and is based in Malta, a nation widely considered to be friendly to blockchain-based enterprises. Actually, it's because they really don't give a fuck there. They just want you to do business there and give them your money. In a, in a December 4th announcement, Vicetti described how E-Force would, will help democratize the energy efficiency market by connecting investors with energy savings projects. Quote, energy efficiency is a way to create a substantial future, a sustainable future, and this is a way to help counter climate change, bullshit, reduce carbon, and to make money while you do it. Okay, make money. I, I mean, I'm, I'm on board. <laughs> in October 2018, Wozniak founded the blockchain, blockchain-based capital venture fund EQ, EQ Global in an effort to disrupt the venture capital and funding industry. In other words, take your money out of your hands and put it in his. Let me see if there's any comments for this. No, no comments. Well, again, this is... I see it as... as an attempt, a further attempt, by one of these brain children to try and direct your use of cryptocurrency. And I, I think that this is really the wrong way to go about it. You know, the, instead of trying to... Instead of trying to present a memetic as the goal, you know, as a meme as a goal, you know, of your of your token instead of doing that why not make a coin that you mine that does not require a lot of energy and that the average person can actually afford to get into it you know make it maybe to where like when the difficulty adjustment bumps it's not so heavy on computing or I, I'm, I'm not that technical on that that end of it but there are efficiencies and tweaks to like the the model of the network you know there there are ways to make it to where you're you're bouncing back so quickly with stuff that you know i mean like if you look at like facebook or twitter the the refresh rate on on your feed is virtually instantaneous throughout in a but of course it's because they have a centralized network and all that but you're a part of their network to some extent Okay, and if you can make mining to where it's it's working like that, and yet, say proportional to your ability to contribute, you know how much energy you're devoting out of how much energy you actually have available to you. Maybe utilizing that as some sort of uh, addition to the incentive model, you know. So like if you're if you're like me and you're you're out in the boonies, if you're supplying a node. To the to the network, and you know, say you've got a hundred megabits worth of worth of bandwidth, and you're devoting sixty percent of your bandwidth to to maintaining and, and linking up with this network, and and providing a node to the network. Maybe if that were some sort of consideration, available resource, proportional reward, you know. So yeah. You, if you got that warehouse and you're dedicating that whole warehouse to it, your your reward will be higher, but it won't be one of these things where like, you know, like you're, like a proportion of the reward is is like, you know, in consideration to not only what you have provided in hardware, but the percentage of that hardware that you have, regardless of who you are. And I think that's a 
there's some way I'm sure to consider that in in the whole schema of things that would adjust the the incentive model to where it's driving smaller people out in fucking rural zones to invest in participating in these networks because that is the real key it is it is the big fucking stumbling block that every single cryptocurrency is running into and the problem is is that it was initially set forward in bitcoin and there are plenty of cryptocurrencies out there that have a a fast enough block time to where it kind of alleviates this this a little bit but you know at the same time there the participation or the reward for participation on them is not necessarily as high as it is on other coins you know the the su- most surprising one this is just a side note there um for me has always been verge and you know this you know this isn't something just because you know this is like this this radio station is associated with them but you know i am always checking up on verge and you know they're still updating shit they're still fixing shit they're still working on it you know it's not like it's it's gone away and died like a lot of, a lot of altcoins are just kind of running around headless out there <clears throat> and it's up to you to figure out which ones i'm not going to you know let you in on that anyway If you look at the the metrics for which which coins are the most profitable to mine, Verge is always in the top ten. I've seen it be number one over Bitcoin a few times. So you know, I mean, if that's any any idea of how fluid this market actually is and how much interest there is on the where you know where the rubber hits the road and and what profits can be made. In this in this whole whole crypto sphere space, you find that there there are plenty of coins out there that you can be mining profitably on lower end hardware. And I I think that in the not so distant future, that little message that I just conveyed is gonna be it's gonna be ringing on in a lot more ears. But anyway, there there's there was something I was getting to there with with regard to these networks. And there's two changes they've, they've made to the way that Bitcoin transactions and the Bitcoin network are treated since the beginning of Bitcoin that I feel have kind of derailed it and made it less possible, not impossible, because it can always change, less possible for it to be utilized like this. Is that they, there are two things that the Bitcoin transactions were to be processed as received. You know, so that they're they're added to the blockchain as received. Not, not, you know, let's fumble around the dynamics of the block so that we make the most money by, you know, putting only the, the really profitable transactions in the block and arranging it like that. Eh, no, no, no. Replaced by fee. That fucked that whole thing up. It was supposed to be as received. You get the transaction in your fucking record, it's done. You you included in your record and when you're sending out your block, it's in the position where where you fucking received it. Not, you know, again, adjusting it for profitability. So that and the block size limit. That, that was not a parameter initially. And so th- this was one of those things that incentivizes people to participate. Is that if there's more block space, you can process more transactions per block. You can get more transaction fees per block. You get more money per block if the blocks are bigger. Or as the network, quote unquote, scales you get more participants and so invariably you'll get more transactions happening on the network and so like i said these are two changes of bit, uh, to bitcoin that have literally derailed its ability to work as intended and the focus has been trying to adjust it and make it into a swift type network to where only the biggest of the bigs can afford those transaction fees for that itty bitty teeny tiny amount of block space. 
and I keep hearing this bullshit screed, and I've been hearing it for at least five years, if not longer, that going to bigger blocks would decent would, would fuck up decentralization. I don't believe that's true. I believe that if the incentives were there that you know my transaction is going to get treated like everybody else's transaction it's going to get Im- included in a block for the 10 minute period of all the transactions that have happened it's going to fucking get in there because or it's going to stay in the 10 minute mempool to be included in the next block but it wouldn't because it ends at the the 10 minutes that's fucking totaled up bam the the mining pool that gets the 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 block sent in all that gets fucking block reward I get my cut of it everybody happy and I I think pooled mining would still exist with with regard to this too but just to increase the likelihood that you'd actually be getting a reward for your effort I mean it's it's otherwise it's statistics although the it kind of I would think that such a model would kind of benefit those that are not necessarily in the most rural areas or if they are in a very rural area that they're providing a lot of a lot of hashing power to the network but those mid zones you know so your suburbs because of course in the in the high density areas you'd have to be fucking you're you're going to be up against really big players because there's a lot more bandwidth available electricity on the whole is probably cheaper you know, especially if you're getting contracts for... <laughs> anyway, the point being is that that I think that would be benefiting those in the middle the most. You know, to where they're, they're still within the zone that they're getting the electricity relatively cheap. They're getting really high quality bandwidth. But they're not the only fucking node out there <laughs> because you know, they're, they're not way out in the fucking boonies and not having to put that additional capital to providing the same the same amount of profitability but anyway those are the two things you know replaced by fee and the block size limit if those two things were to change about bitcoin uh it would not have a scaling issue and you yourself would probably be much more incentivized to mine even with asics available you'd be buying them off fucking ebay you'd be buying like third fourth generation old hardware just to get in on those sweet, sweet transaction fees. But like I said, the focus on, on Bitcoin has been trying to corral it down to these these huge players, you know, Goldman Sachs, JP Morgan, Visa, MasterCard, and, and it would be like their network because they're doing all the transactions on it. Anyway, continuing on. So Wazcoin, interesting... Um, I wish him well. Unfortunately, us in the United States probably won't be able to participate in it. But yeah, I, I think that that's something that'll change over time as well. It's an evolution. But hopefully we'll go back and we'll do things like like <laughs> let, let a Ross Ulbricht out of prison and shit, you know. Anyway. I got some additional stuff I want to get into here, and uh, I do have more on on Wazcoin. I don't know if I'm going to actually get into that per se, eh. but I caught this one, and I think this is kind of important. You know, because we we talk a lot about the the proper utilization of cryptocurrencies, and I think this is kind of a result of the inappropriate direction that Bitcoin has been driven in. And so here it is. This is on uh, QZ.com. The simple reason DocuSign doesn't use blockchain. And this is by uh, John Detrixi. Uh, so yes, penis. And uh, this is authored December 7th, 2020. And the title... Yeah, we got that already... Um, Bitcoin was created more than a decade ago, and technology whizzes have spent recent years trying to use its blockchain architecture for other applications in finance. But, so far, despite high hopes, 
blockchain companies have produced more press releases than viable enterprises. The key reason for that, according to DocuSign Chief Executive Daniel Springer, is that blockchain is still too expensive for the kinds of things his company does. 16-year-old DocuSign runs encrypted e-signature technology and automates and manages agreements from mortgages to healthcare online. Springer says the pandemic has accelerated the shift away from paper contracts and we won't be going back to the old ways of doing things even when the virus is contained. Uh, whatever bullshit. The San Francisco-based firm's shares have more than tripled this year, blowing away even the tech-heavy NASDAQ 100 index of stocks. DocuSign's services resemble, if the pitches in my inbox are any indication, the kinds of challenges the blockchain set has tried to tackle. Think of blockchain as a cryptographically protected database of records that is maintained by a bunch of separate computers. And yeah, that's the wrong memetic, but okay. That ledger of transactions is widely distributed across multiple parties, not centralized, and is seen as being highly resistant to hacking and forgery. And again, this is not correct. You're, you're both, as a miner, you're both a producer and a receiver. You're not just a receiver. Anyway, continuing on. Um, let's see, where is it? Parties in is seen as highly resistant to hacking and forgery. It underpins Bitcoin and has proven to be a robust and enduring. But, using that technology for other purposes, like supply chains, cross-border trade, or protecting healthcare records, hasn't become the norm. Quote, we look at blockchain as an underlying technology that we think is actually quite intriguing, Springer said at a conference in September. Quote, there's challenges with blockchain to date because it doesn't have the scale to provide attractive economics. Yeah, you're not participating, that's why. The company started a partnership a few years ago with Ethereum, a blockchain system that provides programmable contracts but the cost proved to be a serious disadvantage. Agreements using that system cost about a dollar each, whereas DocuSign, which is based in the cloud and protects its records with encryption, is able to handle digital signatures, identity checking, quote, just soup, and, soup to nuts down, down through the agreement for about seven cents. So, to spend one dollar just on the storage is a little bit crazy, he said. Tom Casey, Senior Vice President of Engineering at DocuSign, says that part of the reason their systems are cheaper than blockchain-based architecture is because they've spent more than 15 years specializing in agreements and developing formats specially, specifically for that task. When it comes to blockchain, costs spring up from having to maintain, manage, and operate the infrastructure. In Casey's view, it still hasn't seen the kind of widespread adoption that forces engineers to solve the tough problems that grind expenses lower. Even so, Casey is optimistic about blockchain, especially for protecting identities online. <laughs> yeah. Perhaps it could be used to share credentials in a secure way for a specific transaction and only as long as is needed for that transaction to take place, instead of third parties collecting and keeping that identity information, which could be exploited. Quote, That's super promising for the world, he says. That's one of the things I'm keeping an eye on and, frankly, pushing a little bit. In the meantime, there are some signs of blockchain progress. JP Morgan says it has used it commercially for the first time to send payments according to CNBC. Executives at the biggest US bank the biggest US bank buy assets say those systems can grow in scale. Yes, of course, if you get rid of yeah. Central banks around the world are researching digital currencies, but those projects aren't necessarily decentralized, blockchain-style systems. Casey says blockchain is no panacea, 
but there's still scope for it to become more commoditized and cheaper so that it becomes more widely used. Quote, you could see that drop by an order of magnitude plus, then it might become really interesting, Casey said, but it's not anywhere near that, short, that sort of threshold yet. <clears throat> Yeah, there, there's a lot of conceptual misreads he, in here, and I don't know if they're intentional or not. Um, personally, I would think that given this person's perspective, that it is due to a lack of practical experience themselves, um, you know, where they're, they're pawning these services off on other third parties that are facilitating it for them, you know, like Fidelity or some shit like that. But in any case, uh, you know, I, I think that the the biggest problem again is has been this idea that you can you can drive adoption without driving scale, and again, it's caused due to these impediments that I laid out earlier. You know, even Ethereum, if if Ethereum was a blockless, I mean, like a a, a capless or gas gas limitless coin. They, they would give up on the idea of trying to go to proof of stake because they'd be processing so many fucking transactions and the transactions would be so, so cheap on the average that they they, just give a, they wouldn't give a fuck. You know, your computer's already doing the work whether or not it's actually you know processing active transactions that are going on on the network. It's still doing the work. So, you know, it's, it's a matter of giving it work, you know, giving it meaningful work, that is. You know, that, that's that's the thing about adoption. There has to be an interest in it for you. You know, and again, if, it, if it's limited in capacity as far as the ability to process transactions, I think, again, it's the biggest stumbling block where... You're, you're not able to fully utilize the network that you have. And, and with regard to efficiency, I, I think that's probably the, the point that these people that are saying these networks are inefficient are actually hanging on, is that they look at how much in actual fi financial activity is going on in volume, right? And they look at the volume of the transactions that look... It, it took to make that activity happen and then they also look at the cost for that activity to happen so the transaction fees involved for that activity to happen and when you're looking at it in, in its current state from that perspective you can see that yes it is not efficient however when we when we initially started this shit it was the most efficient network in that it took a really, really l l tiny amount of computing power to facilitate these transactions regardless of your location and regardless of when you actually wanted the transaction to, to take place, that the transaction would get included in a block and it would be processed within that 10-minute period. I mean, my, my initial transactions on the, Bit, on the Bitcoin network were fast. They were counted fast. You know, and, and it's one of the problems that, that was created by, by the idea of replace by fee or restructuring the, the block in a way that it's not actually done by, by means of re, uh, as received is zero com confirmation. You know, that you didn't actually have to get the first com block confirmation in order to understand that the transaction was included because it was processed as received by everybody. And the, the idea of restructuring the block, which was made necessary by the limitation of the block, the, the block size limit, you know, that, that's what enabled the possibility for transaction malleability because it was malleating the transaction already by replacing it. In the order it was received, it was replaced. 
and so you're bumped back down into the mempool regardless of when your transaction was received by the rest of the network. And again, that, that's, that's really what fucked up Bitcoin. If there were an altcoin to be launched right now, those are the things that I would suggest to you is do not have a block size limit. And who gives a fuck about spam transactions? If somebody can spam your network, they're providing nodes to your network. Who gives a fuck? They're still going to be processing all the rest of the work that's going on on the rest of the network anyway. So again, who gives a fuck? They're propagating your transactions whether or not they want to, even in spamming your network. Fucking... People are such pussies sometimes. And that was one of those things where somebody was putting a lot of pressure on everybody else saying, Oh, we gotta do this! Spam the transactions on the network! Give me a fucking break. Again, if somebody is spamming your network, they're providing nodes to your network. <laughs> anyway, let's go ahead and throw back down with some music. Kind of slowing down here. Need some more caffeine. And, uh... I want to do some within the runes. And so here it is. Objective reality. Here on Coin Metal. And that was within the runes. With Death of a Rockstar. Traditionally, we do not allow two songs to be played by the uh, same band in one show. But it happens occasionally. <clears throat> Anyway, uh, it's been a long time thesis or opinion or whatever of mine that one of the chief reasons why the uh, the regulatory frameworks out there concerning cryptocurrencies are so pliable and flexible and change so vastly from one area to another, um, that one of the reasons for that is that the finance minister of, of whatever country you involved, and it doesn't matter which one, will dream up some some wonder but way that he can get around cryptocurrencies and harm the uh, harm the space and resume their monopoly over the money that's transacted within their national borders. And whatever present or whatever proposal it is and whoever it is that's making it, it only makes it so far. It'll get to consideration, it'll get to presentation, but it will never get to implementation. And there's a reason for it, is that invariably, whatever other individuals are involved in the finance ministry or or decision-making process concerning the finances of the country, usually even legislators, will come out of the woodwork and say, this is probably not a really good idea, and we shouldn't do this. And a lot of times these, these measures get stalled at the very, you know, before they're even really legitimately presented. And I'm hoping this is the case again here in the United States. I believe this is uh, an indication that exactly that is happening here in the United States. And uh, so this one's on Coindust.com. It's by Nicholas D. So yes, penis. And uh, let's see, when was this thing authored? Uh, this is authored December 9th, 2020 at 4.29 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. Thank you, Nicholas. I appreciate that. Four U.S. lawmakers want Treasury Secretary Steven Mnuchin to rethink his rumored crypto wallet regulations. Representatives Warren Davidson from Ohio, Tom Emer from Minnesota, and Ted Budd and Scott from North Carolina and Scott Perry from Pennsylvania sent a letter to Mnuchin on Wednesday, quote, expressing our concern about the rumored Self, self-hosted self wallet regulations that the secretary apparently intends to implement in the coming weeks. 
Coinbase CEO Brian Armstrong tweeted last month that Mnuchin was, quote, planning to rush out these new regulations, which would apparently require crypto exchanges to verify know-your-customer data for self-hosted wallets before they could send cryptocurrencies off to their platforms and into the wallets. Uh, yeah, this is to isolate people who are sending money to themselves and then utilizing it for their own ends, such as purchasing drugs or something to that effect. And the idea that somehow or another they're going to interdict in that. Anyway, continuing. According to Wednesday's letter, this potential regulation, quote, would hinder American leadership, absolutely, preclude U.S. actors from participating in the space, and, quote, undermine the Treasury Department from stopping illicit actors from exploiting the financial system. Absolutely. Uh, requiring exchanges to maintain this much KYC data could also threaten user privacy, the lawmakers wrote. Rather, the U.S. should have, quote, regulatory parity between traditional financial systems and the crypto ecosystem. Actually, no, you have nothing to say about it. You think you have something to say about it, but you're effectively talking about making software illegal to use. And that's not going to go over very well. Continuing on. Implementing regulations around self-hosted wallets might have the unintended effect of turning anyone who currently uses one into a criminal, the letter said. Yeah, they're going to try and u turn you into a criminal for using software. Fuck that. The statement published online, David said, or Davidson said, quote, Before Treasury issues midnight rules on the regulation of self-hosted wallets, Secretary Mnuchin should come to the People's House and speak to representatives about what his regulators would do. Uh, you're not going to do anything. Quote, over-regulating self-hosted wallets will crush the nascent industry and leave the United States behind the rest of the world when it comes to harnessing the power of blockchain and cryptocurrency, he added. Absolutely correct. So refreshing to hear U.S. lawmakers understand that the interdiction in our freedoms this way will inhibit monetary activity and thus inhibit our ability to generate wealth and put the United States behind in yet another way. Continuing. This is the second letter most of these lawmakers sent Wednesday earlier in the day. Emer led a, uh, led a letter sent to the Securities and Exchange Commission Chairman Jay Clayton asking the securities regulator to create some clear guidance on crypto custody and direct the Financial Industry Regulatory Authority to approve broker dealers from this space or from the space. Clayton intends to step down from his role at the end of 2020. In other words, he is crypto heavy and he's wanting to walk away with his bags intact. Yeah. Um <clears throat> I actually want to get into this letter if at all possible. So here we go. And this is let's see, Congress of the United States, Washington, whatever. Let me see if I can copy this image and make it bigger. Make it bigger. Here we go. And then we'll paste this bad boy. And expand. And then grow. Grow, grow, grow. All right. And so, from the top, uh, Honorable Stephen Mnuchin, Secretary of the Treasury, U.S. Department of the Treasury, 1500 Pennsylvania Avenue Northwest, Washington, D.C., 2500. Dear Secretary Mnuchin, we write to you to express our concern regarding reports that the Treasury Department is considering issuing regulations that would restrict the use of self-hosted wallets. We request that the Department consult with Congress and industry stakeholders before taking any decisive action. If such a proposal requires the company to determine the owner of a self-hosted wallet which, with which the company's users wish to transact, 
then Americans' utilization of digital asset transactions would be placed at a significant disadvantage to our global competitors. It would hinder American leadership and preclude meaningful participation in the technical innovation currently underway throughout the global financial system. Further, such a regulation could actually undermine the Treasury Department from stopping illicit actions from exploiting the financial system both within the traditional banking system and the digital asset ecosystem. The contemplated regulation would not meaningfully support law enforcement while it would raise privacy concerns and place impractical regulatory burdens on digital asset users and companies. God damn right! Self-hosted, self-hosted wallets enable owners to manage and protect their cryptographic private keys without the use of a third-party intermediary. As such, they represent a foundational component of innovative distributed blockchain technology, a subset of which is commonly known as blockchain, that enables two parties to exchange value on a peer-to-peer basis over the internet. In this sense, Use of self-hosted wallets is effectively a digital cash transaction where trust is established directly between the sender and the recipient, independent of any third party. Eliminating the middleman through the use of self-hosted wallets means that consumers can maintain privacy and transact freely, which is critically important as individuals increasingly conduct their financial lives digitally. Such freedom stands in stark contrast to China's digital yuan, where China's transactions are surveilled and transactions involving disfavored individuals or activities can be censored. Additionally, the permissionless nature of digital assets, inherent inherent with self-hosted wallets, has the potential to expand banking services to the unbanked and the underbanked. Given the importance of such innovation, we believe that any regulatory proposal should carefully consider how to best meet law enforcement needs while also ensuring that adoption of this innovative technology is not stymied. And uh, I I hate to say it, Stephen, but you need to go further in protecting our rights to participate in this freely. And uh, let's see, who was this from? Again, the Secretary of the Treasury's blah, blah, blah. I think this was like Stephen somebody or other. Uh, no, don't save. Um, oh, I'm sorry. It was Stephen Mnuchin, Scott Perry, U.S. Treasury. Apparently it was, I guess, Warren Davidson was the person that put this forward. But yeah, um... Again, this is the same reality that every government runs into. And what you must keep in mind is regardless of how you feel about how this may threaten your current system, you must understand that the only threat to your system is actually you. Yeah, you, Steven Mnuchin. You, and your policies, and your regulatory frameworks, and your taxation, and your bullshit, and your monitoring. You have to be better. If you are not better, you are going to get replaced in people's financial lives by a project ran by somebody who is not old enough to legally vote, or drive, or drink, or smoke a fucking cigarette. Because this, this technology is in the hands of children right now. Children. I shit you not. Children. So this idea that you're going to make it illegal? F- fuck you. This idea that you're going to contain this, this technology by putting this onerous burden on, on the exchanges and on individuals that are participating in this space? It's complete bullshit. The cost of, of trying to implement your desire here is going to be so much higher than the potential benefit of it. 
they, I mean, you, can't, you literally cannot. <laughs> I mean, and that's the thing is that the cost, the actual cost to participate in these networks is so fucking cheap. I told somebody the other day, if I had a cell phone, if I had nothing more than a cell phone and some gift cards that, that you know, I'd put some money on, I can participate in this space in ways that Mr. Mnuchin doesn't even fucking know about yet. And the shit's been available for years. So, you know, this idea that you're going to hammer down on it and you're going to make people do eh, you fuck off. Just fuck off. We'll use all of your your licensed and regulated and bullshit systems again in ways that you, you have no concept of. Unless you're participating in them yourself, which you should be. Especially if you're running the fucking U.S. Treasury. My God. I mean, it's a typical response to this technology. Typical. However, to look at it and fail to see the other potential in this and understand that the potential is so much higher for wealth and prosperity and profit for everybody involved. It's, you got to be fucking blind. You have to be absolutely fucking blind. Or, of course, you have to be fed up a whole bunch of disinformation about how this system, st- how these systems started, why these systems exist. These systems exist because of the failure of the central banks to appropriately react to a whole bunch of financial pressures that were put on it because of expected things, you know, frameworks, regulatory frameworks, the, the down to the transaction monitoring, all that shit makes it possible to front run all of your regulations. All they have to do is find one chink in the armor and it's usually a soft target. You know, somebody who isn't getting paid enough for the importance of their position and is is in in a position to utilize the information that they have available to them in a personally lucrative way. Such as taking payments and rubber stamping entities and saying these guys are wonderful they got great credit their their project is great it's fully audited there's no exploits in the software you can use it you can trust in it and then one or two years down the line when when it's actually profitable to utilize whatever exploits somebody may in fact have bam there goes your hot wallets there goes your cold wallets and you're wrecked <laughs> <laughs> and this is a reality. This is a, it's a big fucking wall out there, and every fucking entity continues to run into it. There is no way around this one. And again, because these systems are not regulated and are not licensed, their class profile is always going to be lower, and especially even to act in a legitimate way on these networks. It's more profitable to do that than it is to comply with these bullshit expectations. It is cheaper to do that than to give in to these bullshit expectations and these regulations. And so it's like with, with that being the, the reality, you can monitor, you can track, you can even try and imply sanctions. But if your sanctions against an individual are in fact not really honored because the rest of the network out there knows that if they start honoring your bullshit mandates that eventually their transactions and their interest are going to be at stake as well because they want people to use Bitcoin they want people to use Monero they want people to use the currencies that they are mining because the more use they get the more transaction fees they get, the more profitable it is for them to participate. So yeah, your bullshit idea of let's constrain self-hosted wallets, you're only going to cut out people in the United States. I said it to somebody on Twitter earlier today that with open source software, playing keep away with open source software only stops you from playing. It doesn't stop anybody else from participating. So yeah, 
get off our dicks and, and, and let it let us get in the game. Anyway, as far as what else I got going on here, <laughs> this, this is another intersection point where the the things that have been labeled as you know best intentions to you know look out for the security and the viability of the system and then uh, yeah whatever has really negative impacts and this one's on uh, cointelegraph.com and uh, this one was by Colin Post who was authored approximately eight hours ago Congress people ask SEC to verify who can custody security tokens uh, that would be everybody co- Congress. So yeah, they they don't really have any say in that one. Continuing. Nine members of Congress have written a letter asking the Securities and Exchange Commission to get its security token guidance straightened out. In a December 9th letter to SEC Chairman Jay Clayton, several members of the Congressional Blockchain Caucus, led by Tom Emmer, asked the Commission to verify rules as to which broker-dealers can custody digital securities. Broker-dealer licensing is required to sell securities in the United States. The letter is also addressed to the Financial Industry Regulatory Authority, FINRA, a self-regulating body that registers U.S. broker-dealers under SEC guidelines. Currently, the rules are unclear, which has resulted in a colossal holdup in registration. As the letter puts it, quote, In the absence of guidance from the SEC, FINRA has not outright denied any broker-dealer applications that involve the custody of digital securities, which would render the applications eligible for appeal. Rather, FINRA has allowed the applications to languish, often for years, or asked the applicants to withdraw such applications. Many have noted that the stalled ecosystem for security tokens in the U.S., unlike decentralized cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin or Ethereum, security tokens register as securities but can trade in a more decentralized fashion thanks to blockchain technology. Today's letter encouraged securities regulator to follow the lead of the Office of the Comptroller of the Currency, which this summer approved national banks to custody cryptocurrencies. Actually, they, they authorized them to custody fiat to back, to back up things like stablecoins. Anyway, continuing on. Blockstack's STX tokens are an example of a registered security. They're looking to leave the sta- that status by demonstrating decentral- decentralization of the network. That determination, too, is waiting on SEC approval. Congressman Emmer's team had not responded to Cointelegraph's request for comment as of public publication time. Um, you know, the, the fact of the matter is is that a lot of their intransigence on this is that they're looking at the regulatory reality. You know, that the, if they start putting their foot on it, they're going to limit their potential earnings in the future. And of course, the the they will alter the financial destiny of the United States radically with just little bitty pushes in 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 this space itty bitty ones best of intentions all that but yeah we're um we're we're at an interesting phase where i think they're they're looking at cryptocurrencies and they're seeing some potentials still and we're still in this this same thought paradigm with regard to crypto is how to most profitably apply it and it, it's got to be taken into consideration the idea that you need if you want a project to scale you need greater participation in your physical network you can't just add users of your tokens to a network and expect that the balance for incentives to to participate faithfully on the network is going to be there. It's not. The more users that you stack in on top of the these networks, the more you place on the incentive to steal 
to not act faithfully, to follow the whims of governments. And the, these are the threats of centralization. You know, people if people wonder what the the big issue is with you know too much of the network becoming located in one jurisdiction or another, and it having to follow the rules and and laws and and regulations of that entity. And it was kind of expected that they they would chase after us for additional money because we are talking about money. But that's that's the danger of too much of the power of any of these networks being consolidated into too few hands. And one of the things that made Bitcoin such a threat in this sense back in like, I want to say like 2010 to 2013, uh, before ASICs really made GPU mining not all that practical anymore, um, up to that point... The, the diversity of, of miners and, and the diversity of location of the miners made it such that you were looking at hundreds of thousands of miners, you know, they, or I don't know about hundreds of thousands, at least tens of thousands of miners all over the network that composed the network. And so there really wasn't any one single point that any government could put their finger on or a cruise missile to and take out a significant chunk of the network. Uh, unfortunately, that threat does exist today, and there are more entities on the horizon that are building up their own fucking warehouses that they plan on putting full of ASIC devices <coughs> or ASIC devices and, and mining and participating in mining, and that's that's all well and good. But I believe in the not so distant future, those are going to be hard targets for both corporations. And governments to attack because I mean that it's basically that that physical representation of your percentage of participation in the network and if I can take it out by bombing it or something like that why wouldn't I again it offsets the incentives too much to be utilizing this technology in the way that it's currently utilized and, and these this is all like part of the evolution of this tech I, I do expect that maybe they will put forward some sort of legislation that limits the ability to mine and all that again these threats that I'm talking about don't go away just because a bunch of legislators put some fucking ink to, ink to paper or, or digits to a sheet it, it, it doesn't matter the physical threat still exists. And speaking of threats, I got this uh, this next one I wanted to cover just before we go back to music. And uh, this one again is on Coin Telegraph, and it's by Connor Blinken Blinkenship, Blinken Blinkensop Blinkensop. So uh, yes, penis. And uh, this one was authored on December third, two thousand twenty dangers of hosting your own Ethereum 2.0 node explained. Number one, what does hosting your own Ethereum 2.0 node involve? It means you'll become a validator for the newly upgraded Ethereum blockchain and be responsible for verifying transactions and maintaining the network. The Genesis block of Ethereum 2.0 launched on December 1st, paving the way for long-awaited improvements to the network's security and scalability. This will involve a shift to a proof-of-stake consensus mechanism, which is regarded as more eco-friendly and eliminates the needs for miners, and also makes it way cheaper to attack the, na the network. Uh, more than 16,000 validators transferred 524,288 Ethereum into a deposit contract before the deadline of November 24th, paving the way for, quote, Phase 0 to launch a week later. The total value of deposits has grown even further since. Participants are not going to be able to withdraw the, this Ethereum until the current Ethereum mainnet, quote, docks with this new blockchain, a process that could take several years. Those who host their own node have had to stake a minimum of 32 Ethereum, 
worth about $19,000 at time of writing. There are also other costs to consider too, such as gas costs and the expense of finding a reliable hosting provider. There's a lot of money to have li- that's a lot of money to have lying around. In exchange for becoming a validator, they'll receive rewards for contributing to the upkeep of the network, but with these perks comes responsibility. Number 2. This is an easy thing to do without it or I'm sorry, is this an easy thing to do without any technical knowledge? <clears throat> Operating on Ethereum 2.0 and an Ethereum 2.0 node can get quite complicated, and wading into this commitment without knowing how things work can result in some costly mistakes. Even if an inexperienced validator makes some innocent mistakes, some of the the 32 Ethereum they have staked can end up being taken away from them if they have been seen to work against the best interests of the network. Should 50% of this 32 Ethereum be deducted, their node will automatically be ejected from participating any further. Given how this would equate to a loss of about $9,500 at current rates, this is best to be avoided. The problems don't end there, though. Full, fully understanding the inner workings of Ethereum 2.0 can be an uphill struggle to say the least. As the old saying goes, time is money, and you could argue that the effort involved in getting up to speed with this new POS blockchain may not be worth the hassle given the rise of staking as a service providers. Number 3. What happens if the uptime of your node is interrupted? you could end up being penalized, eliminating any financial reward from operating a node. It is worth bearing in mind that if you risk being that you risk being penalized even if circumstances were outside your control, a dodgy internet connection, something that's commonplace for many of us living in residential areas could result in in a slashing event occurring. Given how these added outages can be caused by everything from bad weather to water damage and road repairs, relying on the infrastructure you've got at home isn't necessarily the best idea. As a result, many of the people who want to operate their own node have decided to pay for an external hosting provider where they have a greater chance of receiving the type of uptime they need to be regarded as a trustworthy validator. But again, even this approach isn't without potential pitfalls. Selecting a hosting provider that that can't guarantee continual service could trigger financial losses, and you may not be eligible for compensation such as downtime, or as such downtime is often factored into the terms of service. If you are going to opt for an external hosting provider, it's crucial to read legitimate reviews helping you to form an opinion about whether the company is reputable. Finally, always remember that market-leading solutions may not be the best course of action for hosting a node. In November, an Amazon Web Services outage affected countless thousands of websites, including the likes of Coinbase, and such an event would have hurt Ethereum 2.0 node operators too. Are there any other risks that you should be aware of? Keeping validator keys secure is essential, as they can be lost, or damaged, or stolen. Ethereum 2.0 validators who run their own node run the risk of losing their keys, forgetting the password, or damaging the hardware where the keys are stored. In some cases, the hardware may have been physically damaged, but it's also possible for crucial data data to be lost as a result of a technical fault. And yes, all of this can result in some more financial penalties, this time for inactivity instead of block rewards being reduced. This could result in an Ethereum stake being permanently slashed. Security needs to be 
at the forefront of every single person who wishes to become a node operator. Validator keys can also be stolen by someone who manages to gain access to the computer or remote location where the node is being hosted. Messages can end up being double signed, seemingly on your behalf, or a malicious actor could attempt to compromise the network with inaccurate data. If the security of your node is compromised, it is possible that it could be a year or two before you regain access. 5. What are the alternatives to hosting your own node? Companies exist that specialize in validator node hosting. And better still, they can be non-custodial, meaning they have no, no access to user wallets. Platforms such as all nodes provide master nodes, full nodes, and staking services for dozens of different blockchains and have now ro rolled out support for Ethereum 2.0. This brand launched in October 2018 when CEO Con Konstantin Boyko Romanovsky realized just how difficult it is to host a master node given the technical expertise required, not to mention the sophisticated hardware and uninterrupted bandwidth that's needed to. Allnodes says that it now hosts more than 8,400 nodes on behalf of its customers with a value in excess of $130 million, commanding an overall master nodes market share of 13.1%. Instead of getting bogged down in endless technical manuals, the company aims to handle behind the scenes operations so crypto enthusiasts can focus on other things, and it's apparent this thing is just a fucking infomercial for all nodes. <clears throat> and we're not going to go any further. Um, yeah, these are some significant risks to your money, and it's one of the reasons why I don't don't view the potential for Ethereum 2.0 to be all that great. Um, I've never believed in the idea of being able to transition a coins network from proof of work to proof of stake after the fact. That seems like a move of desperation and one that some one that someone does when they're trying to gain greater control over the consensus of the network i.e. the become a ruler of the network. Anyway, let's go ahead and throw back down with some music. And, uh, yeah, here we go. Rivers of Nile, a home here on Coin Metal. And that was Motorhead with Ace of Spades. Seems my program is having a minor seizure here. So we're going to have to close out of it and reinitiate it whenever it finally decides to get back off its ass. And then we'll connect for this last little bit. And so, and apparently, uh, for whatever reason, I, I neglected to switch that over to the correct input device. That's weird. Anyway, that was... <laughs> that was Motorhead with Ace of Spades. And it is with that that I'd like to close out this episode. Thank you very much for listening. I certainly do appreciate the support. Uh, we will be back again on Friday at 8 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. And so until then, I want you all to trade safe. Do your homework. And watch out for your own bunghole because nobody else is going to do it for you. And so as far as our last dance is concerned, uh, let's see how much time we got here. Mm. Uh, yeah, why not? Here we go. Anthrax, antisocial, last dance here on Coin Metal. Thank you again for listening, and you all have an excellent evening. Good night.